This is Look West, a podcast from California's Assembly Democrats. Mental health experts have started to describe the emotional and psychological impact of the coronavirus pandemic as a crisis within a crisis. Suicide and other crisis hotlines are reporting significantly increased call volumes. Experts in domestic violence, child abuse, animal abuse, and more warn of increased risks of violence during the state-ordered quarantine. I'm Jen Hardy with Look West. So how is California addressing the mental health crisis while keeping everyone physically safe from the coronavirus? California's first and current Surgeon General, Dr. Nadine Burke-Harris, introduced her stress relief playbook during a press conference with Governor Newsom. As a world-renowned authority on the impacts of trauma and other stressors on both mental and physical health, Dr. Burke Harris is providing the expertise needed for California to lead the nation in addressing mental wellness during the coronavirus outbreak. I had the opportunity to interview her for this episode. She started our discussion by explaining how she, as a pediatrician, came to learn so much about the impact of stressors. I really came into this work from a standpoint of health disparities and wanting to understand why certain communities um, seem to be having worse outcomes. And really what we understand now is that the science about how, um, how early adversity, how trauma impacts our health over the lifetime uh, is profound. And the truth of it is that um, we only put about, uh, a, you know, a small fraction of that, uh, that science, that knowledge, that research into our day-to-day practice of how we practice healthcare and, and even how we go about our lives in, this, in our society in general. And, um, and in California, we're changing that, right? So that is really something that is incredibly exciting to me. I think that it's an important part of how we, um, uh, how we bring really thoughtful and also evidence-based solutions to some problems that we really thought were intractable. Um, and I think that trauma-informed lens, I mean, I think you kind of ha- probably have a sense that when you start talking about trauma-informed care and the impact of early adversity on, on health and on life and on outcomes, once you start seeing it, you see it everywhere. Like you can't not see it. You can't watch a movie without being like, oh my God, that's the, the impact of their early trauma. And so, um, and so the ability to actually put that into practice uh, feels really important. I mean, what we see and what we understand is that, um, so by definition, a pandemic is stressful, right? Like, you know, obviously not to make light of it, but certainly to recognize that we are in a really stressful time. I think everyone's feeling it, not just the stress of, you know, fear about the virus, um, but also on the, the, the many impacts that it's having on our lives, right? So for uh, many, especially our most vulnerable Californians, right, we're talking about not just stress, but but distress around the economic hardships for people who are losing their jobs. There, there's, um, I think there's a range of experiences that people are having right now. And for some, they're hunkering down at home. And for some, they're really struggling. And they're wondering where the next meal is going to come from or they're at home in a situation that is not safe, right? Uh, and so um, there, we can, we can just and look and see that there is going to be a fair amount of trauma that is coming out of this pandemic. Um, and uh, for me, that's you know, a big part of the reason why that trauma-informed care has never been more important. I mean, we're, we're already seeing increases in intimate partner violence, right? We're seeing increases in um, mental and behavioral health challenges, right? And uh, symptomatology. And so um, 
trauma-informed care has always been important, but now in the context of this major stressor that rises to the level of trauma for many people, right? Um, yeah, there's never been a better time for us to be really pushing that all of our systems and our institutions and, and our um, you know, organizations, both within government and, and in our healthcare system and throughout our communities, really take this trauma-informed lens. Dr. Burke Harris then explained what adverse childhood experiences are and how the research about them has led to a better understanding of how all stressors impact us. So the term ACEs refers to adverse childhood experiences. And these, um, that was the name of the huge research study that was done by the CDC and Kaiser uh, now over 20 years ago when they looked at 10 categories of adverse childhood experiences. Uh, and those include physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, physical and emotional neglect, or growing up in a household where a parent was mentally ill, substance dependent, incarcerated, where there was parental separation or divorce, or domestic violence. And what we know is that when you have repeated activation of the stress response, that leads to release of lots of hormones, stress hormones in the body, like adrenaline and cortisol. And these stress hormones have an impact on our health, right? So they not only impact brain development, impact our mental health, they also impact, you know, the, the wear and tear on the lining of our arteries, right? So they, they impact our immune system, they impact our hormones, right? And all of this leads to the health impacts that we see. And what's interesting about what we've learned is that, so uh, this, this kind of overactivity of the biological stress response that leads to long-term impacts on health, that's now known as the toxic stress response. And we now know that ACEs aren't the only thing that can lead to toxic stress, right? Things like discrimination can lead to toxic stress. Economic hardship can lead to toxic stress. And so, um, and, and the other thing that we know is that if you have a history of ACEs, right, then you're more vulnerable to subsequent stressors later in life having an impact on your health. And that's what we see right now, right? Even now, as we're looking at the fact that, you know, the, the, the preliminary data coming out of the Department of Public Health shows that, um, you know, African Americans are twice as likely to die of, um, uh, as of COVID-19, right, compared to their, their rates in the population, right? And so when we see things like that, we see same virus, different outcomes in different communities. One of the pieces that we understand is that part of the reason for that is the long-term impact of accumulated adversity on the wear and tear of the body that can make individuals more susceptible. When we look at the impacts that we've looked at, you know, research from previous nat natural disasters, we've seen that the impacts can last for, uh, you know, months to years after the actual event. For those who have concerns about the mental wellness of their children during this pandemic, Dr. Burke Harris went a step further to inform adults what symptoms to watch for in their kids. It's kids show can show their stress in a variety of ways, but they oftentimes, especially little ones, don't tell us like, hey, I'm feeling stressed. So um, little ones as young as babies can show changes in their sleeping patterns, their eating patterns, especially babies. They may cry more um, and uh, babies respond really well to, you know, that so safe stable and nurturing uh, relationships. Lots of hugs and snuggles uh, really uh, go a long way um, in helping uh, to support little ones. In toddlers, we tend to see um, sometimes a little bit of regression in a developmental milestone. So you may notice that if your child was previously potty trained or if they were previously sleeping through the night, now all of a sudden they're waking up at night or they're back to wedding again. So we we see that that's a very common thing. As kids get older, school-age kids, they can tend to have more um, 
uh, things like headaches or tummy aches, right? Or they may have trouble paying attention. It may seem like they're bouncing off the walls. They may have difficulty with impulse control. That's a big one. Uh, impulse control and, and behavior, that's really common. And with teenagers, we can see that they can become more withdrawn, right? So you may have to really reach out to them and kind of pull them out. Uh, check in with them to see how they're doing and they can be teenagers can be irritable anyways <laughs> I say that as the parent of teenagers but um, but when teenagers are stressed um, it, they, it can be a variety of manifestations anywhere from being more irritable more kind of like angry outbursts difficulty kind of controlling um, their their moods um, to to really becoming withdrawn, right? And you're, and you're kind of, you're not hearing much of anything, right? In which case it's really important to just kind of gently reach out and, and try to connect. And the most important thing with all kids is number one, helping them understand, uh, main, making sure that their environments are safe, stable, and nurturing environments. Those are really key. And the other thing that I think is really imp important right now for kids is is empowering them right helping them to understand that while there may be you know while we can communicate in age-appropriate language like you know wow there's the this virus and it's scary and so what that means is we have to make some changes in our lives and what we're doing there are actually lots of great ways to um, help kids understand what they can do, like staying home, that's really powerful. You staying home and having to do school at home, which is no fun and even more difficult than doing school at school, um, is actually what you're doing to help keep people safe. And it's really important, and I'm so proud of you, right? Like helping kids make meaning of what's happening and then understanding how their actions are such an important part of fighting this pandemic. The Surgeon General then pivoted to share insights from her stress relief playbook, which aims to help interrupt the negative stress hormone cycle. What we put in the in the Surgeon General's playbook for stress relief during COVID-19, uh, and both for adults and then also for caregivers and kids, were really evidence-based strategies that are, are, are based on review of thousands of research articles over the years. And essentially, what it helps us to understand is right now during the COVID pandemic, when a lot of us may be noticing things that are diff happening differently in our bodies, we may be having more trouble sleeping, right? We may be having, or we may be having a little increased appetite, a little harder time resisting the, the junk food, right? Well, it turns out that just, that's not just in our heads that the effect of the stress hormone cortisol actually causes us to crave high sugar, high fat foods. And it also interferes with sleep, right? Um, and so as we're recognizing some of the, the impacts, if we might be in a little bit more grumpier of a mood, <laughs> for example, right? Stress hormones um, uh, really have these impact on our, on our health. And so some of the things that we included in the Surgeon General's playbook is just number one, how to recognize for yourself or if you're a caregiver also for your child, like what does, how does stress show up for you? How does it look and feel in your body? Is it neck tension? Is it headaches? Is it tummy aches? Or is it just like you just really feel overwhelmed really easily, right? And then specifically, we pair that with uh, some evidence-based strategies about how to reduce stress hormones. Things like regular exercise, 30 to 60 minutes of exercise a day helps to burn up those stress hormones, right? And release healthy hormones that counteract the effects. Um, similarly, nutrition, right? Even though we're craving high sugar, high fat foods right now, it's actually, um, you know, having foods that are high in omega-3 fatty acids like fish and nuts and having fruits and veggies actually help to um, reduce the amount of stress hormones and, and, and support our brains and bodies to counteract the effect of an overactive stress response. 
Meditation. That's one of my favorites that I'm doubling down on right now. You know, it's a great time to download that mindfulness app. And what we see is that our, what our body's stress response is called the fight or flight response. And one of the things that meditation does is help to decrease the fight or flight response and strengthen the, the other part of the nervous system that counteracts that. It, we call it resting and digesting. It's the parasympathetic nervous system. But these things, uh, but meditation helps to strengthen that uh, and strengthen our ability to recover after we've been feeling stressed out. So uh, those are just a few of the suggestions that we include in the Surgeon General's playbook uh, to really help individuals and families be able to kind of manage the stress that we're all feeling right now in as healthy a way as possible. Knowing that some Californians may be feeling too overwhelmed to even read and implement her stress relief playbook, Dr. Burke Harris provided instruction on where to find her recommendations for mental health referrals. On the covid19.ca.gov website, we also uh, recognize that there are a lot of people who are feeling really overwhelmed right now. And for those people, we wanted to make available all of the hotlines that um, uh, to, to address kind of anyone who is feeling like they're in crisis from our uh, suic- from the National Suicide Prevention Hotline, the Domestic Violence Hotline, the, the Teen Crisis Line. Like there's a whole list of, of resources that we made available that people can simply pick up the phone or text. Um, uh, you know, most of these lines also have a text option and just, to, and just to reach out. And there's someone right now there waiting to talk to anyone who is, who is in need and who's feeling overwhelmed. For those seeking the reassurance of how their own health care provider would intervene at this time, the Surgeon General outlined what she would say to her own patients who are struggling right now. Number one, I think the, the, uh, the, the first thing that I would do is to say, you know what, that's pretty normal, right? Like, it's, you're, you're, you're feeling stressed out, you're feeling overwhelmed. Hmm, that seems like a pretty normal response to an, an extraordinary time that we are feeling right now. Um, and then, and the next is really to connect them to resources around self-care, right? I think for a lot of us, uh, and especially those of us who are parents, we're, inc- we're, we're accustomed to caring for others and maybe not caring for ourselves that much. And the thing that I want to say to everyone right now is that self-care isn't selfish, right? That's actually how we get through this. And it's never been more important. So when we are looking at some of the the tools that we shared in the playbook, even if it's, you know, going for a walk or um, taking the just taking uh, taking a break from the news cycle for a little while. The other thing that I encourage my patients to do often is to journal what works for them to notice and and actually write down what are the things that tend to trigger them more, right? Um, in terms of activating their, their stress or their feeling of overwhelm. And then as, they, as, we, as we think about, uh, and, and usually with my patients, I work together to d- agree on a few strategies that we're going to try uh, to address, you know, um, the, to, to, to work on reducing that stress activation, right? And, and, and keep a journal and see, like, how does that work? How do you feel after you do that meditation or after you do that yoga class? Um, and, and what's working for you and what's not? Or even, like, making, for a lot of folks, I say, make a plan. Write it down. What are the things that you're going to do when you start to feel overwhelmed? Who are the three people that you're going to call? You know, what is the, where's the, what are the things that make you feel really good? And, you know, how are you going to connect to them? Um, and then the other thing I really want to encourage folks is to understand that um, right now, it's okay to kind of adjust our expectations a little bit. I think a lot of us are still trying to adjust to the new normal. 
and still have expectations that we're going to accomplish the same amount of work that we were accomplishing before. But now we've got two kids at home and we're trying to, they're, they're trying to do their homeschool and we've got to fix the, the Wi-Fi, right? Like that's just to recognize you like, oh, you know what? I'm not going to get the same amount done. So let me make a plan that says I'm going to get half of it done or two thirds of it done. And hopefully I can, you know, have a conversation with my boss or honestly, oftentimes it's making that negotiation with ourselves. Right. Um, and I think my own medical practice was really working with very, uh, very low income, very vulnerable communities. And so a big part of the work that I um, always did was working with multidisciplinary teams to make sure that our um, that, that my patients were connected to the resources that exist. Right. So right now. Um, you know, covered California, if you've lost your health insurance, if you had an employer sponsored health insurance and you lost your job, you know, not only is it about applying for unemployment, but it's also about getting signed up for covered California. It's about all of these different um, uh, connecting with all of the resources that are out there. And I think uh, that's the piece that I want to say is that for so many people, there are there are resources out there and we're really eager to help folks get connected to what they need. Dr. Burke Harris concluded her interview by sharing what she thinks California's legislators can do to help their constituents' mental well-being during the coronavirus outbreak. Yeah, so I think that our members of our legislature are really um, our trusted messengers, right? And I think that they have an important role to play in helping folks understand what resources are out there and also in, um, in really letting folks know that like, you know, we recognize that there can be, there still exists, you know, stigma around accessing services for mental health and all the other, and really just to, to really encourage anyone who is feeling um, stressed out, overwhelmed, any of the above, right? Like you don't even have to be uh, too far gone. Like now is a really, really great time to be reaching out to a mental health provider and helping constituents understand what resources are available in their districts, I think is really important. Thank you, Dr. Burke Harris, for sharing your expertise. Given the importance of the legislator's role in addressing the mental health of Californians during the pandemic, four assembly members will join us next week for part two of this episode. They'll share their perspective on mental health during coronavirus, who's affected, what they've been doing to address concerns in their districts, and available resources. Here's a sample now. When millions of Californians are being forced to socially isolate, this creates mental health issues that didn't even exist pre-COVID-19. We can't talk about um, moving forward with our economy if we're not talking about the mental health of individuals. In talking to healthcare providers as well as childcare providers, they're very frightened and concerned is that when the students start coming back to school that there's, the, the children may have seen a lot of trauma in their household stress, the lack of being uh, able to meet with their friends, social issues. When we see, like with COVID-19, a virus, we want to immediately get health care and just try to stop it. But when somebody has a mental health issue, we put that as a secondary part of health, and it really needs to be um, in equal standing with health care. Listen next week for more from Assemblymembers Cecilia Aguilar-Curry, Sharon Quirksova, James Ramos, and Phil Ting. I'm Jen Hardy with LookWest. The LookWest podcast is produced by the California Assembly Democrats. When you think of California and politics, remember to look west.